Now, the last point that I really want to take up, and we did start close quite soon after 10, didn't we? The last point I want to take up is where I've gotten into trouble with other people. And it's because of the label and not because of the content. Uh, over 10 years ago, uh, Ray Goldsmith uh, got in a snit about the language I use now. When we think of a unit, a firm, let's say, with assets and liabilities, it can be a bank or it can be an industrial company. The assets and liabilities, each are cash flows over each year, let's say. The assets will generate profits, which are then allocated in different ways according to the liability structure. What the liability structure is, is a prior commitment of expected future incomes. Take a look at someone who has purchased a house by a mortgage here. And that person has an income, and there are criteria for getting the mortgage which basically are how much your income has to be greater than the monthly payments. If that is the situation, then you have a unit that can safely cover the interest and the principal on debt, the payment commitments on liabilities, by expected income, in this case expected wage income. Such a unit will be a hedge unit. My language, it'll be a unit that can fully validate its debts out of current income with a margin of safety and all that. When an economy is dominated by hedge, hedge financing in all of business, certainly when the United States was, you get a rate pattern an interest rate pattern in which short-term interest rates are substantially lower than long-term interest rates. Keynes again pointed out there was a constitutional bias. Lenders prefer to lend short, borrowers prefer to borrow long. Because the hedge speculative and Ponzi is gross, it means it includes both the payment of interest and the payment of principal. Did that get through the uh, noise? Or should I repeat it? The payments include both the payments of interest and the payments of principal. The profits are gross, which means capital consumption allowance and things like that are in the profit flows. Now, if you've got a project that's going to earn gross profits over 20 years, and you finance that project with a one-year debt, the one year's cash flow is not going to pay the entire project back. The only way you can pay that one-year debt back is by borrowing a new to pay that. You can roll it over. Now, one of the secrets of a well-ordered financial system is that if your profit flows are good and they're expected to remain good, you have no trouble rolling over debt. Sometimes it's formalized. You have a syndicate of 12 banks. 
for example, and you borrow $11 million. And every month, every bank is given a January, February, March. And during that month, you will not be in debt to that bank. So when it comes to repay the December, the January bank, right? You borrow from the December bank and pay the January bank. When it comes to repay the, I may have gotten my months mixed up, right? The, the next one, right, you borrow. You borrow always from the bank that's finishing its year, right, to the bank that's a month before it, right, that's ending its year, month after it. So you borrow from the January bank to repay the February bank, from the February bank to repay the March bank. So when the March bank runs out of its month in which you don't borrow from it, you borrow from it. And therefore you can keep $11 million in my example of short-term debt forever as long as you're able to pay the interest on the debt. Governments do that, banks do that, businesses do that with their commercial paper and their bank financing. With, with credit cards in the United States now, households do it <laughs> by swinging from one credit card to another. So you have rolling over finance, rolling over, which I call speculative. The thing about a long-term hedge contract is that you know the interest payments and you know the refi there are no refinancing problems. In a speculative one, interest payments may go up or down on you as the market changes, and you may find that liquidity preference of the lenders has affected how they're willing to deal with you from time to time. Then there's a third thing, which this is a label that got me in trouble, which I call Ponzi finance. There's no reason to talk about Ponzi finance in Latin America today. No reason, no problem in explaining it, I mean. It's not difficult. Because Ponzi finance is when you borrow to pay interest. And that's what Mexico has been doing. That's what Brazil, every time they get into trouble with their debtors, they have these negotiations. They go home and they promise they're going to change their economy around. But there's no way they can finance a $100 billion debt. Brazil almost did once. They're outside debt with, with exports, right? Because after all, the interest on the debt is a prior commitment of export earnings. And if you committed 120% of your net export earnings, ain't going to do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when interest rates go up and down, the position of these countries becomes sometimes speculative, sometimes Ponzi, never hedge. And the debt grows. They have a negotiation, and they agree to lend them the interest. This is the craziest thing possible, because, of course, when they lend them the interest, that enters as income back in their books in America. They've not received a penny, right? There's no expectation of receiving a penny. But they pay dividends to their stockholders, and they pay interest to their own debtors on the basis of income which they just write down in the books where they never got any, any, anything like income from it. Well, Ponzi finance, it means that your debt is growing in a very inefficient way. You're getting neither investment goods nor consumer goods. You're just getting time to the next crisis in this type of structuring. And the next crisis, the debt's going to be bigger by whatever the interest rate is on the debt. So Ponzi financing will occur when a debt burden, short-term debt mainly, but also long-term debt, is confronted with a drop in profits. or with a huge rise in interest rates. And what happens to Ponzi finance is that it both 
leads to cutting off areas from being externally financed and it weakens the financing ability of the institutions when it ends and when it ends because it decreases the institutions profits and available funds now the economy our economy consists of a system of borrowing and lending on the basis of margins of safety there are two margins of safety one is the cash flow margin and the other is the equity margin and when the stock market collapses the equity margin of organizations can disappear even though the cash flow margin remains their class or quality as a borrower disappears. The market valuation of a company is important because it's the excess of their total value of assets over their debt as the market values it. So a sharp, so a booming stock market is increasing perceived margins of safety a collapsing stock market diminishes it now let us state the financial instability hypothesis quickly it is that in normal functioning of an economy the interest rate structure when the economy is doing well and liability structures are predominantly hedged the interest rate structure is such that there is a it's cheaper to finance short term than long term and those who can make the arrangements for financing and refinancing will shift their liability structure and this continues until the margin is eaten up which means higher short term rates relative to long rates short moves up relative to long the long rate being the market determined rate really and then if you have rising interest rates short term finance euphoric or good expectations in the economy you develop financial structures where any drop in income or a rise in uh, interest rates will transform some firms to Ponzi financing. When there are firms that are Ponzi financing, bankruptcies will occur. Bankruptcies will affect the liquidity preference of lenders and borrowers, right? Which will draw in the external financing margin and an economy where the prime generator of profits is business investment or household fi or housing financing the collapses so it's an endogenous process based upon how financial markets behave and how profit seeking portfolio managers and bankers behave and businessmen behave there are agents operating for profits there are agents who manage portfolios who have to have risk and uncertainty valuations the risk and uncertainty valuations are unfortunately myopic in regard to the past and imperfect with regard to the future and therefore a capitalist economy is subject to booms and busts. Fini.